we're here with Bruce McGregor, who you may recognize as the author of several books. And he's also a volunteer here. So why don't you tell us, Bruce, a little bit about the organization and what you do here? Thanks, John. We're standing in front of uh, the car that actually started the organization. And in a way, uh, this car goes back before the museum was even a museum. It was brought to Ardenwood in 1978 uh, from Keeler, California. We found it. It was a car that was built in Newark by Carter Brothers. It had kind of all of our history rolled into one. Uh, and because the car was here at Ardenwood when people started talking about a park, it actually germinated the thinking that people brought to the idea of a park at Ardenwood and helped people see a railroad as part of it. So that became, I would say, more than conceptual by 1982, 83, and the Railroad Museum got, a, got its official launch about 1984. Uh, based in a large part on South Pacific Coast Caboose 47. This car was changed very little, very little wood replaced. Um, the Southern California deserts were uh, hot and dry, so they kind of mummified the car. And while it looks like it's in terrible shape, actually, uh, it's got so much original material in it that it's got original paint samples on it. It's kind of a map to what it was when it was built uh, in, the, in the 1870s. And what it was built as was... Um, kind of a uh, multifunction car. This railroad um, not only had freight to move, they had less than carload lot gear, LCL freight. Uh, so it's got a baggage compartment at one end, it's got a passenger compartment at this end, and you might find it on a, a freight leaving Boulder Creek um, behind other freight cars, but it would c carry milk, it would carry mail, uh, it would carry a package that your uh, your aunt wanted delivered from Santa Cruz to Boulder Creek, so it served as kind of a kind of the bus and the Federal Express van all in one. Uh, given all that, it was actually uh, in all all in a fairly primitive frame. This car this car's architecture dates to the 1860s. It's got what's called a duck bill roof style, and no cupola. The thing that most people think of when they think caboose is a cupola on top. And uh, this car doesn't have one. It never did have one. We'll, we're storing one next, right next to it that did have one, but it's from a much later period. So this car was built in 1882 with um, just post-Civil War architecture. It was almost like the Carter brothers threw back 20 years to come up with the roof line and some of the architectural details. Would, would it have been common for other cabooses of the time to have cupolas? Yeah, exactly. So in comparison, this was kind of a... An, an anachronism, I guess is the word. Someone might even think of it if they saw it as, oh, look, it's just another freight car in the back. Almost. It, it, looked, it looked like it had um, some passenger car features. It's got a clerestory roof, but the little details, the end roof, end finish is called a duck bill because of the shape of the end. And it's, it's definitely a, just a post-Civil War feature. Uh, more modern passenger cars that actually were built by Carter just a year later started incorporating newer features. This is definitely a throwback car. So it, it is a caboose, it was built as a caboose, but it's far more primitive. Um, looks its age, actually looks its age minus 20 years, <laughs> if you wanted to know. But it's, it's uh, a beautiful thing and it's a rare artifact because of its age and because of the amount of original material. One kind of reality check is that railroad cars got rebuilt on an average of every five, six, seven years because they were wood. And because they wore out, because they had lots of uh, tension and shear forces operating, they loosened, the wood wore out, it rotted out, uh, depending on the climate. This car was unusual in that uh, it was rebuilt minimally and taken out of service about, um, about the First World War, 1917. So that after that, it served as a goat pen uh, in private hands and didn't undergo those changes. So we get to see... We get to do archaeology on the car. We get to see it in its original form. See, now this caboose we're in front of now looks a little bit newer. What, where'd you find this one? Well, it is, John. It's, it's quite a bit newer. But imagine that. It looks newer, too. And I, th I think one of the, the cool things is having these two cars park right next to each other. So we've looked at 47, primitive, no cupola, uh, much older architecture. This car built, we think, 1901. Uh, and obviously you can see the cupola, which every kid knows is what cabooses have. So this is also a freight caboose, did the same job, uh, but did it in the Redwoods north of here. This ran on 
the Northwestern Pacific Narrow Gauge, Sausalito to Duncan's Mills, California, served the Redwoods, uh, and used uh, was used on freight trains very much as Caboose 47 was, but has a different architecture, has a different feel. Also wood, uh, but uh, just little modern appliances, lots more safety appliances. Safety came in big time in 19... 04 with federal uh, regulation. This car has got uh, safety appliances like grab irons, like ladders, like things to keep the crew safe that Caboose 47 never had. And again, you get that comparison between kind of the primitive era and a more modern era that was beginning to be regulated by the Interstate Commerce Commission. So this Caboose uh, will be restored back in a kind of a 1915 appearance with the safety appliances in, with the cupola on it. Uh, it'll look a little newer, still wood, but it'll look like a, a car from a different era. This is an end railing that was one of the parts that you would have found on the car originally. Part of the, sa the number of safety-oriented parts that were there to protect the crew. In this case, we wanted a part that was completely accurate. It was not on the car when we got it. So one of our jobs at the museum in a restoration is to cre not just recreate any part that looks good or looks reasonable, but to actually use the process that they used to make the part when it, the caboose was new. So typically a blacksmith would do that work. And this part, if I can hold it up without, without hit, hitting us both, this part is an end railing, so it would go uh, on the end, end of the car that you're looking at in the background. But this entire shape was forged with a uh, 5,000 uh, pound drop hammer, heated, and then the drop hammer was used, for example, to flatten the area where the bolt would go and to create this shape. So this was all done in a blacksmith shop in Oregon by a modern blacksmith named Berkeley Tack, who's actually a, kind of a member of the family, even though he's far away. And Berkeley made all, all of the replacement parts for this car. Every single part that we're putting back on the car was done with original techniques, original blacksmithing processes uh, by Berkeley Tack, our blacksmith in Oregon. Yeah, I, th I think having it done in the same fashion or in the same, the, using the same processes that were used in the past is a neat touch because it can actually sort of bring it more to life for people that are checking it out. Exactly. It's not just an artifact. It's an artifact in all the processes that were related to it. When you see a car in a museum, uh, sometimes it's hard to appreciate the processes. Here at Ardenwood, I think what we're trying really hard to do is to make the processes visible. So you'll see people, for example, using uh, mortise and tendon joints to join two wooden beams. You'll see blacksmith parts made in the tr traditional way. A lot of those par processes are actually going on here uh, so that people can see them as well as the finished product, the car itself. Right. And there's something to that old saying that they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> That's where I'm making it up. <laughs> The 040T off in the distance is the Anne Marie. It's a Porter locomotive that was brought in for this weekend's event.
So we're here at Ardenwood, and we spent most of the morning just kind of filming the, the little train that they have running through because they have a steamer that they don't run all the time. We're going to go back to the main area and see what else they're doing. What do you think about what you've been seeing so far, Dan? It's pretty cool. It's a 040T uh, Porter steam locomotive, three foot gauge, and they've got a bunch of vintage cars that they're pulling. So it's pretty neat. So we'll be back with some more interesting stuff from Ardenwood. So you know I'm always talking about doing something different. I'm really doing something different this time. I'm up on top of a boxcar talking to Brooke Rother. He's, well, I'll let, I'll let him tell you what he does here at Ardenwood. Hey, my name is Brooke Rother and I'm, I'm the head restorationist here at Ardenwood. And one of the main things that we do and we were set up to do originally was restore old cars. This particular car came from the 1880s, which is quite a while ago. and through a new number of circumstances, most of them not normal, this car survived. It was put on the ground, which means it was t not in railroad service anymore about the turn of the century or soon after that. And it was survived as a shed. And that's how we found most of these cars is as in people's yards and as, as sheds. This car here has actually had all new siding put on it. All the, all the shiny parts are all already been restored and the roof is the last part that needs to be replaced with new wood. These cars are all completely, completely wood with a few pieces of metal in there to bind things together, long rods with, that, that are tensioning rods. Everything becomes an adventure with doing these cars because it, you, know, you don't go to Home Depot and buy wood for these cars. All the wood has to be searched out, it has to be dry, it has to be the right kind of wood. The wood for this roof is coming from a tree that was cut down a hundred years ago and never cut into lumber. Um, the, the heart itself, the red wood of a redwood tree is the center part. And I have a picture from the man who's sawing it up for us. And the heart is 12 feet wide across the center. And there's a picture of him and his saw laid out on this big, huge tree trunk, you know, sawing it into us, wood for us and for other people too but it's hard to find these guys and it's hard to find the product so that's a, that's part of the fun of this job is that you're always on a different adventure you're always looking for things that aren't around anymore that aren't part of our lives anymore and it's it's a very enjoyable it's very rewarding and we get these together and we get them to run um, it's very rewarding I think people have fun and we have you saw a couple of cars in the car shop that look like they're just wrecks and they'll never amount to anything 
And one of our goals, one of my goals, is we're going to be riding down the track in those before I get too old to enjoy it. <laughs> Gary Smith, I'm uh, one of the owners, there's two owners, uh, Tom Gagey and myself, and we bought this locomotive kind of derelict, uh, missing parts, remanufactured a lot of the valve parts and uh, controls and uh, had to scan scrounge all around through the uh, internet and eBay uh, to find antique components that like valves and the headlight to bring this thing back up to where it should be. Now when we when we found it, it was just about gone. So a lot of parts were gone. So we had to, to start from scratch. Originally the Cortez mine was a 30 inch gauge mining railroad, small gauge, out in the middle of the desert with no connecting railroads. And when we got it, we had to re-gauge to three foot. That way we could run it here and a few other tracks in California. And now it's a 36 inch gauge locomotive. There was a lot to do that. The wheels had to be put on different axles. They had to uh, widen the cylinder blocks. We had to just, everything had to be wider about six inches. So that meant three inches per side widening. So once finished that, uh, a lot of valve gear and the mechanical motions and all that had to be refitted, retimed, and uh, brought back to life. So the whole idea is to take something forgotten and make it usable again and share it with people that can appreciate um, machines and what they can do. And today this was the common workhorse in industry. If it was mining or shipping on the docks, um, lumber, uh, the, the 040 quarter set saddle tanker was uh, very common. It'd be like buying a Jeep today, and except it's much stronger and heavier. We haul 120 people on three very heavy cars, and she just does a good job, and uh, we love this engine. Shine your shoes with that. As long as it's black. Yeah. <laughs> Little trains, big trains, kind of in between trains. We saw a little bit of it. goats. I saw goats over there, rabbits, yep. garden trains. There are a lot of trains in this. I got a lot of stuff here. Yeah. So, so what, what did you think? I liked it. It was fun. I I'd never. I mean, I have been here before, but last time I was here, I think they still had the horse-drawn uh, carriage on the rails. And, yeah. Uh, I'd never been here before. Yeah, this was a long, probably at least uh, maybe 11 or 12 years ago. So it's it's, you know. And that was the only time I was ever here, and this was much cooler today because they were actually running a, a steam train. Yeah, it's unusual. I, I wasn't expecting to see a coal-fired anything here today. So, anyway, is there anything else you wanted to say about this? Okay, nothing else? Yeah, thanks. Okay, we'll catch you back in this studio when we're not so damn tired. Mm -hmm.